Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I just want to, uh, before I kick off here, thank uh, members of the uh, Edmonton United Services Institute for inviting me to join you today uh, for this discussion. I think it's uh, quite apropos and quite timely. Uh, I don't know if that was uh, uh, done uh, with a, gr a degree of foresight or not, or just uh, happenstance, but uh, the topic obviously is very timely, uh, given recent uh, announcements by our current government about the, uh, the desire for uh, a renewed uh, involvement in uh, certainly UN uh, peacekeeping operations around the world. And my apologies for turning my back on f fellow members of the panel here, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll carry on and use the podium uh, for this. As, as, I, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to be with you today to discuss this. Uh, as mentioned, I'm currently serving as the Chief of Operations at 3rd Canadian Division Headquarters here in Edmonton, the G3. Um, and, uh, and I've been asked to join you today to provide some insight on uh, peacekeeping, peacemaking, and, and perhaps what the current Canadian Armed Forces uh, plans are uh, and what our involvement is uh, in, in current operations. Up, up front, though, I need to provide a bit of a disclaimer. Um, these are largely my personal thoughts, coupled with the information that I'm privy to by virtue of the position that I'm in as Chief of Operations. It is very much, I'll, I'll be up front, it's very much heavily focused on army operations, the use of land forces that I'm, I'm familiar with. And my apologies to members of the RCAF, uh, both current serving and former, and the Royal Canadian Navy, that I'm, I'm not going to touch on their involvement in UN operations to any large extent, uh, but they certainly have played a, a significant role in the past, and, and perhaps other members of the panel will speak to that uh, later this morning. Um, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the Canadian government. I'm speaking as a serving Canadian officer with experience in overseas operations. Uh, my first experience was with UMPRA 4, uh, having graduated from Royal Military College in 1993, finishing phase training in Gagetown and, uh, and joining the 2nd Battalion PPCLI uh, in August of 1993. The battalion had been deployed to Croatia in Sector West. And it was truly, for me, a baptism of fire um, and, a, and a huge eye-opener for a young officer uh, as that m was my first experience serving in, in the regular army and on operations. Uh, my father had been in the military as well and had served in Cyprus, and so I had an idea of what peacekeeping you know, missions looked like from a family point of view and from media, et cetera, but to experience that as a young officer in an environment, as, as Norman Leach just indicated, for Umprefor, uh, it was quite significantly different. Um, so without further ado, how am I advancing here? There we go. So what I'd like to do is uh, discuss some of the, uh, the current realities, um, but I thought it would be useful to sort of pile on to what, what Norman has said uh, this morning already in terms of... Uh, you know, Canadian Armed Forces' involvement in peacekeeping operations in the past and how this has shaped our perceptions and understanding of these operations and provide you with a general sense of what operations the Canadian Armed Forces are currently involved in in terms of UN peacekeeping operations and then provide some observations, uh, some comments on the current realities of modern peacekeeping operations and, uh, and what is being currently planned within the Department of National Defence. I thought... Uh, this was uh, quite, quite apropos, this, this, this uh, quote, uh, that peacekeeping is a job not suited to soldiers, but, only, uh, but a job only soldiers can do. Um, and I, I think that there is a great deal of truth to this. However, the reality is uh, successful peacekeeping operations cannot be solely focused on military capabilities and responsibilities. Although there's a desire for many of us in uniform to fill whatever vacuum might exist on, in the area of operations, and oftentimes, uh, we don't have the resources, the expertise, or indeed the mandate to do some of the other activities that peacekeeping forces or peace support operations uh, are required to help with, deal with, with the civilian populations, uh, but also with bolstering or improving uh, host nation governments uh, and improving the overall peace process. Uh, in our opinion, it's, it's very much, it must be a comprehensive approach uh, in which the military certainly plays a role, but cannot be the only and complete solution uh, to modern peacekeeping operations. I can tell you straight up front that the Canadian Armed Forces, your Canadian Armed Forces, are extremely well suited to, the meet, to meet the demands of peace support operations or peacekeeping operations, whatever term you wish to use. 
Uh, we have a wealth of experience in complex operations as by virtue of the last few decades for sure, uh, certainly within a multinational context. And, uh, and, and we're familiar with the importance of joint interagency operations with our federal partners, with multinational coalition partners, uh, military and other government departments. That is what we train for, that is what we focus on in our collective training uh, because of the, complex, the complexity of the environments which we operate in today. Uh, the Canadian Armed Forces brings essential resources and capabilities to such complex operations throughout the spectrum of conflict. Uh, so we bring a command function, a structure, a chain of command that allows us to not only coordinate and manage daily operations, what are, regardless of what they are, but also plan future operations within that overall uh, mission. We bring reconnaissance and surveillance capabilities, the ability to sense what's out there, to understand the area of operations or the battlefield, uh, and then to be able to posture and react towards that as the situation changes. We bring the ability to employ fire and maneuver or kinetic effects as required, and a clear understanding of the laws of armed conflict, which is absolutely essential uh, for modern operations today. So we have the ability to use force, in a very precise manner, if need be, and restrict the use of force within the laws of armed conflict uh, to not jeopardize the overall mandate and, uh, and, and, and rules of engagement. We have the ability to provide protection, both for serving military personnel, but also members of the overall uh, uh, effort. Uh, we have the ability to provide armored vehicles, for example, um, that provide a level of protection. We have the ability to maneuver through areas that are, are dangerous or non-permissive. Uh, we have the ability to set up camps and provide protection for people to work from, uh, another essential component of modern operations. And we have the ability to sustain these efforts through logistical capabilities and capacity. And although there's been a great deal of rhetoric uh, uh, by many people uh, about Canada's limitations, uh, every military has limitations. Um, and our ability to sustain operations is certainly something that we keep a very close eye on, but it's an essential component of these operations, be they peacekeeping or peacemaking, et cetera. The ability to s sustain oneself and not be dependent on the host nation or other nations uh, for that critical support. So therefore, I mean, we are, we are very much capable of operating uh, in peace support operations across the spectrum of conflict. Uh, but we and we form a, a critical component of uh, Canada's uh, efforts to do so. But we're not the sole component of that effort. So this uh, this slide I thought was useful because it kind of illustrates a perception of what is UN peacekeeping. Uh, and we immediately envision blue berets, blue blue helmets. Uh, but what is peacekeeping? What is peacemaking? Uh, peace support operations or peace enforcement. All these terms tend to be used uh, quite liberally to explain, well, it's a UN operation, blue berets, blue helmets, it's military use of force. Uh, we need to establish, maintain, or, uh, or indeed promote peace in the region. Uh, and are these terms indeed still relevant today? But I thought this picture illustrated some of these key expectations of, you know, that I don't know, you can't see across the top there, but it says protect, stabilize, and consolidate peace. And then down below, one mandate, one mission, one force. Um, it, unfortunately, it's not as easy as that. There are many, many complex natures to modern operations, uh, but I thought this was useful as a, an illustration of perhaps a perception that's out there. This gives you an idea of the number of UN operations currently being managed. Um, it's, I know it's difficult to read, but around the globe, there's uh, quite a few of them in Africa, uh, the Middle East, Asia, and indeed the Caribbean. Um, I just wanted to throw this up there for, again, a, an illustration of the volume of peacekeeping operations that are managed by the UN and the, uh, and the, the drain or the, uh, the demand, I should say, on military forces uh, to support those operations, all for the right reasons. But as you'll see in subsequent uh, illustrations here, uh, the, there are large numbers of military forces involved in these UN operations, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Canada will be playing uh, a more of a role in that in the years to come here. 
some current thoughts, and I thought it was important to also illustrate uh, some of the rhetoric that's being used right now in a Government of Canada press release. I'll just read it here for you. So you can, Canada remains committed to building a more peaceful and prosperous world. Its increased support to UN peace operations is centered on a whole of government approach combined with diplomacy, uh, deployment, training, and capacity building, and includes conflict prevention, mediation, peace operations, and peace building efforts. So it's, uh, one could surmise it's the complete gamut there from what we would call left of bang, preventing uh, a conflict from occurring, to right of bang in uh, putting a, a, a country or several nations back together uh, after a conflict. And Canada's role in that uh, will be renewed in the days to come here. Um, but it, you know, some of this rhetoric here, it, when we talk about uh, peace building or peacekeeping, one would have to surmise that there, there is an element of peace to maintain. In some of these conflicts, there is no peace yet. Um, that it's maybe not uh, warring factions, recognized warring factions, wearing uniforms uh, uh, recognized by their nations, but indeed uh, illegally armed groups or insurgents or terrorists, which adds to the complexity of the modern military operations. Peace may be the objective, but are we really conducting peacekeeping or peacemaking? And is the intent to protect populations from a variety of threats? Regardless, whatever operation the Canadian Armed Forces are assigned, it's essential that there's a clear mandate established with clearly defined objectives. And, and with this should come robust and effective rules of engagement that enable military forces to achieve these stated aims. I think when we talk about what are the resources required, uh, that's very much it. Uh, regardless of what operation we, we become, become involved in, having a clear mandate with clearly stated objectives uh, is absolutely critical for us and the rest of the whole of government team to operate from. And as I mentioned, you know, the military arm of that uh, must be considered a part of the solution, but not the solution. And as our Prime Minister said, moving forward, we will increase Canada's support to United Nations peace operations. So I find it interesting that even our, our government is using the term peace operations uh, to describe a variety of potential operations that we will be involved in, rather than uh, discuss specifically about peacemaking or peacekeeping, but simply peace operations. So uh, as, as Norman Leach indicated, you know, we have a, a history of peacekeeping operations, certainly within Canada, and I think that this is uh, very much in line with what he has just uh, articulated, where uh, it's a generational view. Uh, there's a, uh, a bit of a nostalgic view in terms of our experience in Egypt and Cyprus, and I, I won't go into any more than that, as Norman has covered it extremely well, uh, but that certainly has been one of the perceptions that's out there among the demo a certain demographic in Canada, uh, as I mentioned, he's, as, as, a, as a guy in high school whose father was in Cyprus, I mean, that was a perception of what UN peacekeeping was all about. That, uh, you know, units were leaving Canada for six months at a time, but they were all coming home. And the, the danger uh, wasn't extreme to what has been ex experienced uh, in the last decade or so in other places. And the, the focus of these peacekeeping operations, uh, certainly in the 50s and 60s and 70s, was to, to maintain peace between recognized warring factions following an established peace process with an agreed peace accord by and large, to a large extent. Uh, so there was some methodology to it. There was a recognition of warring factions. There was a green line, a demarcation line, or a demilitarized zone between warring factions. Uh, and the warring factions wore a uniform that was recognizable. Um, still very complex peacekeeping operations, but with recognizable uh, symbols and, and, and factions uh, that aided that ability to maintain that peace. Rules of engagement were quite limited with a focus of maintaining observation of these peace agreements and reporting violations. Uh, there, was, there was a desire to intervene clearly between warring factions, but perhaps not to the extent that we've seen under uh, a NATO-led coalition uh, with peace support or peace enforcement operations but also the tools may not have been available for those peacekeeping forces on the ground, be it Cyprus or Egypt. Uh, although these, these operations involved a degree of danger, uh, as, as Norman indicated, these, these missions were relatively peaceful, although people lost their lives and many were injured in the context of modern operations today. Uh, you know, there wasn't a significant IED threat, for example, 
in Cyprus to the degree that there is in places like Mali or indeed Afghanistan today that create a very non-permissive environment for military forces and other government, uh, other government departments to operate within. And Canada's contributions were seen to be very beneficial to the UN, but quite acceptable domestically here in Canada, I would argue, that there was a level of uh, acceptance of that type of operation in Cyprus and Egypt. It was seen as an important and useful operation, useful use of military forces, and was quite acceptable domestically in Canada. As we transitioned into the 90s, things, things started to change, as Norman indicated uh, quite, quite clearly. And I think these are some of the images that, that people, that resonate with people today, uh, younger generations of Canadians that were not exposed to Cyprus and Egypt, but have grown up knowing that there was a breakdown of the former Yugoslavia, that Canadians have been operating under UN Blue Berets in the past, but in a more complex and dangerous environment such as Yugoslavia, where not everybody made it home. And places like the Medak Pocket, uh, again, as a young officer, uh, with eyes about this big, uh, as my platoon warrant uh, and I started to uh, uh, upload ammunition at our, in our platoon in support of that operation, uh, something that, that was never, you know, ne somebody had never prepared me for that. I was going into a UN operation wearing a blue beret and blue helmet, and then all of a sudden we're loading up our APCs with uh, double first line ammunition with, uh, you know, M72s and extra extra machine guns and grenades because uh, we were going to enforce the peace accord and uh, a huge eye opener. But we're certainly prepared to do that. Um, so, but it, there was a significant change in the methodology and uh, and the complexity of those operations had increased. Uh, Canada sent multiple battle groups to the former Yugoslavia, and these battle groups were very much combat capable and prepared to use the force use force to uphold these security agreements. There were very much unit-sized deployments, a unit of being well over 600 soldiers uh, with a variety of, of uh, capabilities, with their own indirect fire capabilities, anti-armor, uh, armored vehicles you saw in the other presentation as well, and, and in this one as well, you know, armored recce uh, using our APCs, and then in subsequent peacekeeping operations, we were able to de deploy the LAV-3 as well, and certainly in Afghanistan. Uh, with the Airborne Regiment in Somalia that not many of us uh, speak about as well, uh, the, the use of force uh, to support the peace operations, but it was a combat-ready, combat-capable force deployed to that theater of operations. And as you can see in some of the pictures here, uh, although under a UN flag, uh, very much uh, a, a, a combat-related focus during that operation. Um, and these forces in these theaters in the Balkans, Somalia, uh, and other places uh, were very much, um, have been engaged or were engaged in kinetic operations, either as part of the mandate or particularly in self-defense as the Medak pocket and, uh, and other operations have, have shown. But the experience in the 1990s, uh, 1990s under these UN mandates perhaps caused us to move away from UN operations and shift towards NATO efforts. At one point there was some 38,000 international military forces involved in UNPROFOR, seeking to keep the peace in the, middle, in the midst of a civil war, yet there really was no peace to keep. And there were constrained rules of engagement, as you've heard, um, on UN forces. And on behalf of some UN nations, or UN force-contributing nations, a reluctance uh, to use force. And I believe that this ultimately led to an unsuccessful mission under an unperfor construct, under the UN construct, and perhaps discredited uh, that effort to some degree, unfortunately. And the responsibility for the crisis uh, in the former Yugoslavia shifted from the UN to NATO, as you've heard. Uh, and NATO deployed uh, more combat-capable uh, forces to fulfill the UN mandate and uh, institute a degree of peace and stability in the region. But I believe that perhaps, you know, consequently, Canada's interest in UN peacekeeping operations was reduced in the 1990s as we focused more attention on NATO and other coalitions to achieve our collective objectives in terms of global peace and security. Uh, and recent experiences demonstrated that peacekeeping operations have become, as I said, more complex, more unpredictable, and more dangerous by virtue of some of the, the warring factions that are out there and the tools that they're willing to use, the, the complete disregard for laws of armed conflict and human rights violations uh, that exist in some of these places, extremely dangerous and very unpredictable. Um, 
and our experience clearly in Yugoslavia and, and Afghanistan and places like that have proven this. But at the end of the day, it's essential that Canada generates forces and personnel capable of operating in such complex and challenging environments, which will involve various defense and security partners and stakeholders, multinational partners, other government departments, and our own uh, federal partners here in Canada to operate collectively uh, within these theaters. So in terms of what we have today around the world, we have just over 100 people from the Canadian Armed Forces involved in UN peacekeeping operations. So a significantly reduced number to what we had experienced, certainly in Yugoslavia uh, in the 1990s uh, and other places. But I thought it would be useful to indicate our, our current commitments for you today. Uh, and I apologize in advance to some of these slides that, are, that may be a bit difficult to read here. Um, but perhaps this is why there's a, a renewed interest in, uh, in participating more uh, within the UN operations. Uh, what I'll talk about here is uh, these, these five key operations. So op Operation Crocodile is our commitment to the Democratic Republic of Congo. Op Soprano, we have uh, soldiers in the South Sudan. Op Snow Goose, believe it or not, we have one individual still in Cyprus. And that, that guy probably won the lottery. I mean, he, he clearly clacked, cracked the code and has one of, probably one of the best jobs out there as, as the lone Canadian in Cyprus upholding traditions and honoring, honoring former Canadians who, who, who worked there before. Um, and uh, I think it's a pretty jammy go. But nonetheless, we still have one individual in Cyprus. In Op Jade in the Middle East, uh, I'll talk a bit more about an Op Hamlet in Haiti. Um, Op Jade is, is Canada's contribution to the UN Truce Supervision Organization. Uh, and it's responsible for monitoring compliance with the ceasefire between Israel and the neighboring states of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. And we, uh, they're, they're Canadian Forces personnel deployed with Task Force Middle East. They, they serve as UNMOs supporting UN operations in Lebanon and the Golan Heights. And for Op Hamlet, it's Canada's contribution to the UN stabilization mission in Haiti. Uh, and its mandate is to support a constitutional process in Haiti to help maintain secure and stable environment. Um, again, I apologize, you can't really see that terribly well. But in Congo, just to give you an idea that there's some 22, over 22,000 uniform personnel involved in that UN operation at the moment. And there's been some 263 fatalities. We have uh, nine people involved in that operation uh, in, in the Congo, uh, and a pretty significant budget uh, that's been allocated, a UN budget, of well over uh, $1.3 billion a year uh, to provide uh, some, some stability in that region. The focus, uh, you know, the, the mandate is really uh, the protection of civilians, humanitarian personnel, and human rights defenders under imminent threat of physical violence, and to support the government of the DRC in its stabilization and peace consolidation efforts. So a, a small number of Canadians involved in that. This map depicts the, the country of uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and what you can't see on there are the number of troop contributing nations and the size of their organizations of subunits, so company level, squadron level, uh, various headquarters staff in various locations throughout the Congo, um, and, uh, and Canada continues to contribute to that um, in a small way at the moment. In the South Sudan, we have uh, 10 people involved in that operation. Uh, its, its mission uh, is to, um, or the mandate rather, is towards the protection of civilians, human rights monitoring, support to the delivery of humanitarian assistance, and for the implementation of the cessation of hostilities agreement in South Sudan. Again, a large number of UN personnel there, over 12,000 uh, military troops and military uh, observers, and a uh, quite a significant budget allocated to South Sudan, with uh, 43 fatalities in the past. Again, uh, an another map showing you the, the layout of, of troop com contributing nations there. Um, uh, throughout, and that, that changes uh, on a fairly regular basis as, as troops are rotated in and out. In the Middle East, as I mentioned, um, we have sta four staff officers as part of this, and this is the longest standing uh, since May of, of 1948, uh, longest standing UN operation that we've, we've been involved in. Um, and uh, we're monitor mo troops that are monitoring the ceasefire, supervising our mistis agreements, and prevent isolated incidents from escalating and assist other UN peacekeeping operations in the region to fulfill their respective mandates. With a budget of over uh, 74, 000, 74 million, rather, 
uh, with fatalities in the past, upwards of 50. But as I mentioned, we have about four Canadian staff officers there. Additionally, in the region, uh, Canada is involved in what we call Op um, Calumet in the Sinai. And this is Canada's participation in the Multinational Force and Observers, MFO. It's an independent peacekeeping operation in, in the Sinai uh, that we've uh, maintained since about 1985. Uh, in Op Calumet, there's approximately 35 military police and additional support from, uh, from personnel around, so it's around 50 people in the Sinai, 50 Canadians. And we're providing the task force commander. Uh, we have various uh, staff officers in UN headquarters in support of other operations, uh, but really, the, as he said, the number's around uh, just, just north of 100 at the moment. Uh, another map indicating where people are. And then Haiti. So Haiti, uh, obviously, uh, Canadians have been there uh, frequently in the past uh, decade, and uh, we continue to maintain a, a, a footprint there, about five staff officers. Uh, unfortunately, it has been quite a dangerous place uh, for a variety of reasons, not just the civil, uh, civil strife there, but obviously with, uh, with earthquakes as well. Uh, we have, in, in the mission itself is uh, uh, over 2,000 military personnel, uniformed military personnel, and again, a pretty large budget per year. Uh, in that operation, and we'll continue to send Canadians uh, to support that. So the modern realities of peacekeeping and or peace support operations. Again, a, a quote here from our Minister of National Defence I thought was useful. That even using the terminology of peacekeeping is not valid at this time. Those peacekeeping days, those realities do not exist now, and we need to understand the reality of today. And it's very, very key uh, for us. Uh, it's very difficult to use one term to describe the current operations. And peace, peacekeeping operations perhaps is a misnomer. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's simply not a problem for the military to solve. Um, peace, uh, what I'll call peace operations or peace support operations will remain very complex and will involve increased risk due to the nature and threat of the environment as I've, in, as I've indicated. Assigned military forces need to be robust enough to operate within this environment yet cannot be seen as a sole solution. Uh, these operations will require a comprehensive whole-of-government approach that is reliant on diplomacy and development efforts just as much as defense and security efforts. And the Canadian contribution needs to be resourced accordingly and be served with a clear mandate and objectives. Assigned military forces must be capable of operating across the spectrum of conflict due to the unpredictability and complex nature of these operations. And at the end of the day, as I mentioned, you know, Canadian Armed Forces provides a variety of, of resources to support these efforts, a, st a structured command uh, uh, organization, a chain of command, able to manage daily operations and plan future operations, the ability to provide reconnaissance and surveillance and understand what's going on in and around the environment, both outside the wire, but also among, partner, uh, among uh, uh, close neighbors or, or other nations. The ability to act, the ability to actually use kinetic forces to fulfill the mandate and, uh, and, in, and enforce uh, whatever peace agreement may be in place. The ability to protect the force uh, through, again, use of armored resources or indeed the use or the threat, uh, the deterrence of force uh, and be able to set up uh, positions to operate from and the ability to, to sustain that. And I believe we've come a long way and we talk about our experience in the Umpra Four Bosnia days. I remember as an officer coming out of Bosnia and at the airport in, uh, in Zagreb, uh, all of us in, you know, the, the company lined up in three ranks and we were ordered to take off our flak vest and helmet and leave them at our feet. And we did a right turn and marched off and got on the airplane to come home and the guys that were coming in were marching on to our helmet and flak vest. Uh, we've come a long way uh, from that era where the troops that deploy now to operations are extremely well resourced. Uh, whether it's with personal protective equipment or weapons, uh, night vision equipment, uh, our, our communications equipment, and indeed the armored vehicles uh, that protect us. Uh, we've, it, it's been a, a tremendous uh, evolution, I would argue, within the, within the Canadian Armed Forces, and, uh, and we've come a long way. Uh, so that's a, another indicator of, of, uh, of how we've progressed for sure. Right, and then the reality here, I mean, these are the modern tools of peacekeeping or peace support operations. You know, there's attack aviation. Uh, there are maritime units, uh, armored units, uh, use of artillery, uh, use of UAVs and drones. Uh, all, the, all the tools that modern militaries are using for conventional operations are indeed equally applicable for peace support or 
peacemaking or peacekeeping operations. As I mentioned, you know, we, we are, the, the military provides an ability to establish austere locations to work from, such as this UN camp in Africa, that demonstrate the, the austere nature of such uh, an installation that allows all of our, our members to operate from in a safe and secure environment. We provide that level of protection that's absolutely critical in some of these very uh, non-permissive environments that we may find ourselves in. So next steps. Very quickly then, what's been announced is that Canada uh, will commit to uh, future operations uh, and what has been committed thus far is that uh, from, the, from Global Affairs Canada, 450 million has been earmarked for peace operations. Four, 47 million for international peace, uh, the police peacekeeping programs that the RCMP will become involved in. 17 million for expert uh, deployments at the UN and elsewhere. And this will involve 400 to 600 military personnel and 150 police. Uh, it will likely include air transport, medical and engineering and training or capacity building and specific locations have yet to be confirmed. And I know a great deal of work is being done uh, to, uh, to confirm uh, the future Canadian commitments uh, under a UN operations in Africa. Uh, we anticipate more clarity following the UN Leaders Summit later this fall. And the expected timelines, uh, we're not sure about. It may be happening as early as the new year, or it may take some time to establish uh, a footprint on the ground, depending on which nations we end up operating in, whether we pile on to existing UN missions in the Congo or South Sudan, or, or uh, begin uh, uh, to become involved in other operations uh, in uh, Western Africa. Uh, but there's clearly an uh, increased desire for more Canadian Armed Forces involvement in overseas operations. And this will create more demand on the operational units and brigades in the Canadian Army, as well as our primary reserve. That is absolutely critical in helping us as the regular force to manage uh, the, the demand uh, for these uh, expeditionary operations, uh, current and uh, in the future. And depending on the diversity of these operations, uh, there may be some command and control challenges. As you've heard as well in the news, uh, Canada is committed to uh, being one of the framework nations for uh, NATO uh, in Latvia uh, un and under the uh, OPRI assurance. And uh, so we will have Canadians uh, involved in, more Canadians involved in operations in NATO in Europe. We still have our commitment in the Middle East uh, in support of coalition efforts uh, in Iraq. And we will have another mission uh, that is becoming more complex uh, in Africa. So three significant theaters of operations that we'll be managing in the years to come. Uh, that will con create challenges for us, uh, but not unsurmountable challenges by any stretch. And there may be sustainment and support challenges as a result for the very same reasons to, to service three uh, pretty complex theaters simultaneously. But at the end of the day, the Canadian Armed Forces personnel are well suited for these types of operations by virtue of our current focus on war fighting uh, and our ability to operate within a joint interagency uh, environment. Uh, our focus must remain uh, war fighting, the most complex type of training and operations that we do on the, on the what we'd, we would say the extreme side, the right side of that spectrum of conflict. We have to focus on that in our training so that whatever happens in our operations, uh, we have an appreciation for the most complex and most dangerous, and then we can operate through the remainder, of the, the, the remainder of the spectrum of conflict. And we cannot allow this to disappear. So Canadians should expect to see Canadian combat forces deployed uh, in Africa in the future, and those forces prepared to use force as necessary to achieve the stated aims and objectives. It will be complex, there will be risk, and there will be dangers to those involved, but the military chain of command will mitigate these risks and dangers as much as possible by ensuring our personnel are well prepared to deploy, having gone through a robust and effective training regime. And the true challenge, I believe, will be aligning the whole of government team towards achieving these assigned objectives. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'll leave it at that and uh, look forward to hearing more comments from uh, esteemed colleagues here as part of the panel.